Welcome to our Industry Insights panel on strategies for getting it hired in the finance industry. My name is Sam Yu, and I am the employer and alumni liaison for New York University's Career Center, which is your host and organizer for this event. And I will be moderating this, uh, our discussion this afternoon. Um, the Industry Insights panel series is co-sponsored by the Alumni Relations Office, and we'd like to thank them for their generous support. Now I'd like to introduce our, uh, to you uh, our panelists for today. Um, on my far um, far end of the table is uh, Jane Atkinson, Assistant Manager of Recruitment at Social Bank. Um, next to Jane is Edward Ditching, Sales Manager of um, Eastern Canada Region with Bayside Financial. Next to Edward is Richard Williams, President of World Financial Group Insurance Agency of Canada Incorporated. And Richard is also uh, a your alumnus. Um, and next to Richard um, is Stephen Pellissa, Senior Manager with Deloitte. So the purpose of uh, this session is to connect you, the student with professionals from various financial services firms so that you can learn more about opportunities available um, and gain insight into how to best search for and secure these, uh, these kinds of opportunities. And we're also hoping to give you a little bit of opportunity to um, do some networking and ask some questions um, that you may have um, to our campus. So before we begin, I'd like to um, ask you to please turn off your cell phones and mobile devices so that we can be free of any interruptions. If you haven't done so, make sure you, before you leave today, um, please sign in at the registration table just outside the doors. Um, and um, if at any time you do need to leave the, um, the room during the session, we ask that you open and close the doors quite, quietly and gently. Um, the doors do tend to make quite a bit of noise. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the Career Center or the services and events that we um, um, offer, um, feel free to pick up one of our booklets, which can also be found at the, just outside the doors, um, or you can speak to Danielle, who's outside, um, or me, um, or better yet, come to the Career Center, we're in 202 Milwaukee College. Okay. Um, so we will have about an hour for discussion. I will get us started with a few questions um, for our panelists, and then um, we will take questions from the floor, and there is an audience mic in the middle of the room. Um, so um, I, will, I do encourage you to, um, those of you who, who are, um, who can summon up uh, enough cur uh, courage to come up to the mic, please do so, and, and pose your questions to the um, uh, panelists a little bit later on in the afternoon. At approximately quarter, uh, quarter after three, we will begin our informal mix and mingle networking session. Um, so you, at that point, you will have an opportunity to speak face to face with our panelists and ask any specific questions you may have. Questions in, uh, in the large group setting, that's fine. You can ask your questions later on. And we will end today's session promptly at 4 o'clock. Okay. Um, so I'll get us started. So the first question I have for our panelists is um, if, uh, if you could uh, tell us briefly about your respective organizations, um, your role within them, and um, what you think distinguishes your organization or um, makes you proud to be part of that organization. Um, perhaps we'll start with Jane. I'm with Scotiabank. Um, we are a global bank. We operate in 58 countries in the world. Uh, we have approximately 81,000 employees, um, and so we're proud to be uh, one of the we're one of the five main uh, largest banks in Canada. And our goal is to be um, a premier financial institutional provider. Um, my role: I've been with Scotiabank for seven years. I've held different recruiting projects across the way. Um, I've, I've recruited nationally for Scotiabank, mainly, mainly for the domestic retail branch positions. For example, anything from the customer representative role, which is the teller, uh, through the, the sales officers. So personal banking officers, senior personal banking officers, financial advisors, account manager, small business, manager of customer service. So that's been my role primarily within the organization. Uh, sorry, uh, the last part of that question is what, what do you think distinguishes Scotiabank or what makes you proud to be part of Scotiabank? Well, um, there's a lot of opportunities at Scotiabank and um, it's not uncommon for people to have more than one career while they're with us. So uh, we do provide you with the resources and the tools to navigate your career. And, um, and I think that Scotiabank is, um, it just really gives a lot of people to really grow and develop in their careers. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm from Faith Life Financial. My name is Edward Ditching. And uh, before I proceed, I'd like to introduce Kim Sanderson, our regional director for uh, Eastern Canada as well. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Yeah, um, Faith Life Financial is a faith-based 
member-owned financial services organization, providing life insurance, income protection, and investment products for our members. Uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, financial services organization, and th what that means is that we reinvest our profits to, uh, to our members, back to our members, and the causes that they, are, that they care about. And uh, I myself, I, um, my role in, in, uh, at Faith Life Financial is as sales manager, and my main focus is on uh, recruitment of uh, financial representatives. Um, and that's in the uh, Ontario area. And uh, what was the last question again? What would you say distinguishes Okay, so uh, yeah, I've mentioned it, that uh, what distinguishes us from the others is that we are a not-for-profit service organization, financial services organization. Thank you, my name is uh, Richard Williams. I'm the president of World Financial Group Canada. Uh, we're part of the Aegon family, which is uh, one of the largest uh, life insurance and pension companies in the world. We have approximately 27,000 employees. We run in 16 different countries, and we have about a half a billion in assets. Uh, world Financial Group is the distribution arm of Aegon, and we, uh, we distribute financial services products all over North America in all the United States and Canada. And uh, my job is obviously uh, to recruit people from an agency perspective but I also uh, run the, uh, the insider or home office side of our business. So we have two really aspects of, our, of what we do. Um, what makes us really unique is we're a very entrepreneurial company and uh, that uh, attracts a lot of younger people to our organization because they want to have control over their futures. Thanks very much. Oh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Paul Lusak. I'm with Deloitte and Touche. You guys may have heard of us. We're, the, I think, the largest accounting firm in the world right now. We've got offices everywhere in the world. Um, and in particular in Canada, I think we've got about six, 7,000 employees. My role is I'm not really a recruiter. I'm here on behalf of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Business Valuators. So that's my designation. I'm what's known as a CBV. And we can get into that a bit more later, exactly what a CBV does. It's a very interesting and diverse career path that you guys might want to consider as you're going through your studies. Uh, Deloitte is a great organization. It really provides great training. It's very focused on the employee. It's very focused on the community. Every year we have our impact day where we go into the community and help out, do charity work, and we sponsor all kinds of things all during the year. And it, it's a really a great firm where you can really get great training. Yeah, thank you. Um, so next we'd like to ask our panelists to um, tell us a little bit more about the types of employment opportunities or roles available to the students and their graduating, uh, graduates, um, new graduates um, in, in, within the firm and perhaps um, uh, we'll start with Stephen, uh, with, um, um, within the type of work that you do. Uh, well, uh, Lloyd's an accounting firm, so we have all different types of accounting that you can do from what is most familiar to people, which is to go into, like, become a chartered accountant and go into the auditing stream, uh, which uh, you can do, I believe, right from university. And that's a great, I mean, the CA designation is, is an excellent designation to have, even if you don't use it to be practiced as a chartered accountant. If you look, if you ever look at like a lot of presidents of big companies, you'll see a lot of them are CAs. It's a really good designation to have. It gives you very good training. We've also got uh, a big consulting group. So some of those guys are not necessarily CAs. They could be MBAs. There's some certain consulting designations. I'm not that familiar with what they are. We've got our group, which is financial advisory, where we're, uh, some people are CAs. We're also CBVs and we do, business valuations, we provide help to lawyers when they're, for lawsuits, figuring how much to sue for or, how, or defending, helping them to defend lawsuits. There's also our corporate finance group, which does like mergers and acquisitions um, and that sort of thing. So there's very, there's, it's a very diverse firm. I was, uh, been with Deloitte for about five years now. I was with another firm called Minson Partners. I don't know if you guys ever would heard of that firm. And we were like a medium-sized accounting firm of about 150 people, 20 partners. We merged with Deloitte in 2008. 
And I didn't even know all the stuff that accounting firms could do. It's amazing all the different departments and specialties so that they have there. So you can, like I said before, get really, really good training there. Well, we really have two streams in our organization. You have what's called the sales stream or agency stream, and then you have the corporate side. Uh, obviously, on the sales side, you have the opportunity to become or start a, an agency with our firm. But on the corporate side, uh, we do run various departments uh, such as accounting, um, compliance, uh, uh, licensing, actuarial. So we have a very broad spectrum of opportunities from a home office perspective. Yes, um, I think uh, we need to as well to um, draw back and just uh, maybe just um, see the bi the bigger picture. Okay, when you uh, if uh, anybody wants to go into the financial services industry, there are different streams. You can go through banking, you can go through um, investments, or you can go through insurance and. Uh, that is where the insurance stream is where we are focused in terms of our company, of our organization. And um, so there are different um, opportunities, and the, but the main opportunity that we, are, we have are actually right now for uh, financial representatives or to become fin financial advisors and uh, grow in that career and follow that stream to be financial planners. So uh, that is the main uh, opportunity that's available, but otherwise, from time to time, there would be needs for uh, you know marketing people, for administrative people, back office people, uh, IT, and uh, so, you know I know you guys are very adept in using the 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 online resources. So you know if you have time, visit uh, uh, www.faithlifefinancial.ca, uh, and uh, we post our. Uh, job opportunities in there. Thank you. In terms of um, entry-level opportunities at Scotiabank, um, I'll talk about it first on the branch and then the non-branch side, um, and then also we have a call center. So uh, for the retail branch positions, we offer training programs. So you ha would have a four-week training program if you wanted to become a customer representative with us. Um, if we offer training for uh, the personal making officers, it's two to three months. Senior personal making officers, financial advisors, it's six months. Um, and basically it's on the job training, which would consist initially of going online um, for the, on the sales side, learning about our investment and lending products, doing online testing, job shadowing with the, the, the person in the role that you're going into, um, your branch managers, your in-branch coach, who eventually would be evaluating you based on um, your interactions with customers, and then we also have a learning advisor in the Toronto head office who holds group and individual conference calls. Um, they take you through role play scenarios and skill practice sessions. So we provide a lot of training and feedback to you while you, you're going through the program um, for the retail branch positions. Um, the call center, we have a call center at, um, in Scarborough at 888 Birchmount, um, and the, the role that um, they have a number of different departments there, they have an inbound and an outbound call center, so inbound calls are coming in from customers, um, handling calls in English and French, and as well as responding to emails on anything to do with daily banking transactions, um, helping them with any questions or concerns that they may have, renewing JCs, RSPs. Um, and then you could be also making outbound calls to customers, existing customers, to help expand on the types of products and services that um, we offer. Um, on the non-branch side, we do have um, co-op opportunities that are available to students. So if you haven't already visited our website, we would recommend that you do that um, to find out more about those kind of opportunities that are available for you. Um, on the more on the operational side, so anything to do with accounting, um, audit, compliance, finance, risk. We have many different departments. Um, that are supporting the infrastructure um, for the branch world. So there are a lot of junior entry level type of opportunities that are available and we would welcome that you visit us online and discover more about those kind of opportunities as well. They could be offered on a contract basis. Um, they could be offered uh, in a position where it could be temporary which could lead into full time. So there are a number of different kinds of opportunities that would be available there for you. Um, so as a follow-up to that, um, often in my conversations with students, um, they express that they're, they're not quite sure how to get their careers in the financial services started. Um, so they, they have a sense of what they want to do, and they just don't know how to get it started, and what kinds of skills would help them to stand out as part of uh, in, in getting that career started. So I wonder if the panelists can uh, provide some specific advice to students about how to stand out um, as applicants. 
clients and um, new bank candidates um, and how they can possibly connect with opportunities. Uh, well, I know Deloitte is, uh, does on-campus on recruiting. I don't know if they do it at York or not, but I know they do. They probably would be looking for students who have very good marks uh, in accounting, for, for sure, or finance. Uh, so I think that would be good. If you, it's like for any job nowadays. You want to get good marks. You're not here to screw around, hopefully. You're here to do well and get good marks. It's very, that's probably one of the important things. And then just be personable. And if you want to become a chartered accountant, you have to do your CA. If you want to go into, um, if you want to go into like mergers and acquisitions, maybe doing your chartered financial analyst is very popular nowadays. A lot of some people do their MBAs in finance. That's always a good designation. So um, I guess starting off, you probably would need an undergraduate degree of some sort, probably like a, a Bachelor of Commerce with a stream in accounting or finance would probably be your best bet for those things. Now some of the other more specialized areas I'm not 100% sure like as far as some of the consulting uh, departments go and what they're looking for. But you can also, like the other panelists were saying, you can also go to our website and um, I'm sure there may be probably a lot more information there. It's, it's a very good website so you can probably get a lot more information there. I think one of the most important thing is deciding where you want to be in financial services. If, it want, if you want to be on the sales side or the corporate side, and that's sort of your vision of where you would like to be in your future, you need to make a decision around that. Uh, as you know, financial services is very diverse, so there's a lot of opportunities and very you know, specialties in, 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 the, in this world. Uh, my background, actually, I came with a psychology degree, and it wasn't a business degree and got into this business. And what attracted me about this opportunity is the people side of it. And so I think one of the things that you need to really look at is your people skills, which are very important, but also looking at trade, uh, trade opportunities in terms of trade, uh, like the CFA or CFP, or taking various designations to add to your undergrad degree. Because those are all really important if you want to get into the financial services business. Yes, I think I agree with you. Um, um, for somebody who is not, who is interested in going to the um, industry but does not know specifically uh, which area or which stream to follow, I would, I would suggest that uh, they call and they ask. Okay, that's the best way. Ask the, you know, whoever is uh, in charge of it. Just ask because. Uh, uh, for our organization itself, you know, we have, uh, we have a um, specific training programs that we're in. If you are not yet, you know, sure about the career, just ask. We'll let you go through it and see if it fits. If it does not fit, then, you know, maybe it's not for you. So bottom line is ask and try. That we look for um, in candidates who are interested in a career um, in retail branch banking um, are not only that they have either a college or university degree, um, whether it be in commerce, finance, business administration, accounting, uh, but also who have completed some of the um, industry related designations, such as the investment funds in Canada, the Canadian Securities Course. Because if you are going to some mutual funds, you need to have either of those designations completed in order to become legally licensed to some mutual funds. Um, if you're interested in a career path from there to become um, a financial advisor, uh, that would entail doing financial planning. So we would, at some point, encourage you to complete the professional financial planning and the certified financial or certified financial planning designation. Either one of those enables you to do financial planning. Um, at the branch level, we're looking for strong sales performers, so people who have sales experience, whether it be working in a retail store, um, in a call center, where they've been an account or an account manager role, any type of position where they've actually had to, it could be either prospecting uh, candidate uh, customers, handling rejection, um, presenting products, and asking for the business. So um, that's the, those are some of the kinds of things, that the skills, the education, and the knowledge that we're looking for for people on, on the retail branch side. And just for our panelists, a number of you mentioned designations. Um, are, are, is the expectation that students get 
get those expectations on their own prior to joining the firm, or is that something that they can pursue um, with the support of the firm? I think as far as Deloitte goes, you just you don't have to have your designation when you first start out. Most people don't. Um, like a lot of people who are in the auditing and accounting have like an undergraduate degree, and then while they're at the firm, they work towards getting their CA designation. And like we've got uh, people in our group, we've got one guy who's got a CA I think last year. Now he's working on his. Uh, his uh, CBD designation, and at the same time, because it was very ambitious, at the same time he's doing his certified financial analyst designation. So you don't have to have, a, for our organization, you don't, to just start off at an entry level, you don't have to have the designations. You'll get the training for it while you're there, because it makes it a lot easier. Like, to get your, your CA without having done the work is difficult. First of all, you can't get it without having the work. You have to have the practical background. Same thing with the uh, uh, CBV designation also. You have to work with the CBV. You have to have, I don't remember offhand how many hours, but say at least a thousand hours of practical experience before they'll even let you write the uh, comprehensive final exam. So you just have to have an undergraduate degree to begin with and then go from there. I should mention that all these designations like CA, CBV, I'm not sure about CFA, but I know for CA and CBV, you have to have an undergraduate degree to, to go into the program. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if you show a, an interest in taking any of the courses, I think it's very powerful when we're looking at resumes. But most of the time, people that we recruit into our organization, we work with them as they get these designations. So we either help finance them or we coach them through the process of getting them. So like a CFP or CFA, CFA, yes, you need your undergrad. CFP, you don't. Uh, but any of the other insurance designations, you usually don't need them, but it is helpful to have them on your resume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, just to add that, um, yeah, it is, I think it's even best to be in the industry and take those courses at the same time. And that way, the courses that you take, the subjects that you take, become relevant in your actual practice. And, uh, you know, some, and, you know, if you get a certified financial planner designation, for example, it requires experience anyway. So, as a fresh graduate, you don't need uh, anything except your diploma, and as long as you have the interest, the passion, the people skills, you're good. Um, I will consider candidates who don't necessarily have either the IPIC or CC completed prior to starting with us, um, but it is a prerequisite for um, the personal banking officer position. So we can still take you through our hiring process at the end of which if you're recommended, usually we will place you on hold until you confirm that you have completed either of those designations and then we will extend the offer at that point. And the reason for that is because the demand for the business line uh, for this particular role is very high and uh, really what we want to do is help to set you up for success. So when you start with us, um, you can focus on our two to three month training program and also you can hit the ground running and you can start selling mutual funds. If you don't have the IFIC or CSE completed, then we would basically need to wait until it is completed before you can actually start selling mutual funds. Um, completion of either the professional financial planning or certified financial planning designation, you don't necessarily have to have that completed prior to starting with us. It is a banking um, industry related designation and then um, upon successful hire, um, that is a conversation that we would want you to have with your branch manager and they would start to encourage you to take that designation and we would pay for that. I think just let me just mention that the way also pays for uh, they pay for you to, to go through and get your CA, they pay for the courses, they pay for a, a preparatory course, and they pay for the exam itself for your first go round. If you don't make it on the first try, they don't pay for your second try, and if you don't make it on the second try, you're out. But they do pay for it initially. Thank you. Um, so Richard, you mentioned um, resumes and cover letters, so I think that's a good um, um, lead into my next question about what do you what do you look for in resumes and cover letters? So as part of that, initial recruitment process, and also you, um, if our panelists can talk a little bit about what you expect from the interview as well. So to start, first of all, what, what do you look for in a resume and cover letter that helps, us, uh, helps the candidate stand out? And then what do you expect, what do um, candidates expect during the interview process? Well, you, you might laugh at this, but no, no spelling mistakes. That's uh, pretty important. Uh, that, that shows right off the bat if you're really interested in the role and if you're serious. 
Um, you know, what, what, what we look is, when I look at a cover letter is really a, an expression of why you're interested in the role, why you want to be with the firm, why you feel it would be a good fit. And a, sort of an understanding of the corporate culture is really important to us. So one of the challenges I would say to anyone that we're looking at is do you understand or do you have an understanding of our organization from a corporate culture perspective and if there's a right fit. From a resume, a resume perspective, if you've got some background in, in our business or our field, I would look at your experience and where you've come from over the last bit. If you don't have experience, I would see what you've done on your own independently to uh, make you a unique candidate to the opportunity and what you've done on a personal basis to really distinguish yourself away from someone else that's applying for the role. I think what's important as well is uh, in the resume is um, show a pattern of success in your resume. You know, um, extracurricular activities was, would as well help. Um, and, uh, you know, s state the reason what mo motivates you. Why do you want to, uh, why do you want that job? Why do you want to be in that career? Well, in terms of resumes, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of different types of resumes, whether your chronological resumes listing their work history from most recent to going over the past five or ten years to um, functional resumes where people like yourselves are students, they might have gaps in their work history and they don't necessarily want to reflect that, but they might pick uh, two or three categories of experience like customer service or um, administration work or, um, you know, another competency that they've developed over a period of time. So um, I am looking for people who have d demonstrated uh, what kind of experience they have clearly on their resume, that, again, no spelling mistakes, um, and, and their objective, indicating what type of career path they're interested in or what type of position. They don't necessarily have to indicate what employer, but I think that and when candidates are applying to positions, they do need to have um, some kind of a, an idea or of what type of position or career path that they would like to get into. Um, because when you go in through the interviewing process with us, these are some of the kinds of uh, questions that we are going to start asking you as to why this position, why special aid, what is your career path. You need to have that kind of understanding and that I think that kind of information should be also be reflected on your resume. Uh, yeah, I have to just basically concur with what everyone else has said. Like, no spelling mistakes. That's like really important. Like, the best thing to do is get somebody else to look it over. You know, it's so easy, like even now, like when we write reports, it's very easy to miss things the first time. So have someone, your mother or your dad, or somebody you think would, has some business experience, look it over, not just for spelling mistakes, but just for the language and the way it's written, just make, make sure that it makes sense also. I mean, that's very important. Uh, make sure it's accurate. There's no point in putting stuff down that's not true. It'll get found out eventually, and that'll be a whole disaster that you don't need. So just make sure it's accurate. And it's good to also put down some of your extracurricular activities that you've done, charity work that you've done, volunteering. That's good. People, love, Employers like to see that kind of thing nowadays. So, And also keep it brief. People don't have time to read like 10 pages worth of a resume. Just keep it to one or two pages at the most in a very clear way. And also the other thing is, don't send the same exact resume to a million people. Tailor it specifically to the place you're sending it to because people see that and they'll just say, oh, this guy will take anything, whatever. So just, you know, if you're applying to Richard's company, do some research. His company is online. You can look it up. You can find out about it. And then tailor it towards that. It'll take you longer, but you'll be much more successful than if you just send the same thing to like some, you know, random resume there to all the people you're applying to. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Career Center does provide resume and cover letter support. Um, so um, you're welcome to attend the workshop and then a book a one-on-one -on -one session to review how your resume or cover letter review. Okay. Um, so the second part of my question was about interviews, but um, before I get panelists to answer that question, I'd like to at this point, at this time, invite our audience to come up to the microphone and um, think about So um, the second part two of that question was, 
what can candidates expect um, if they are selected for an interview? What, you know, in terms of the format, in terms of um, what interviewers will be looking for, um, how can they, any tips on how to prepare for and stand out in the interview? Um, perhaps we'll start with Stephen. Uh, first of all, there are a couple of things that may seem obvious, but first of all, make sure you're on time. If you come like 20 minutes late for an interview, you may, as well, you may as well not even show up. Secondly, dress professionally, like in a suit maybe, or at least a blazer. Don't be wearing jeans or shorts or anything like that. Um, just be very neat in appearance. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, you know, that's like, the, that's like the important thing. Have your resume with you, maybe several copies of it, in case there's more than one person interviewing you. And, you know, that's basically just like the basics, really. Yeah, I agree. I think some, some other points is that you should know something about the company. Um, we, we typically ask you what you know about our firm uh, to see what type of interest you have in the organization. Uh, not a lot of detail, but you should have an understanding of the corporate structure and, and uh, where we do our business in and what products and services we sell. Uh, so that's pretty important. I agree you should come well dressed. Uh, you should have an up-to-date resume if it's changed along the way. and. Um, basically be uh, fairly open to any questions that we do ask you about where you want to go and why you're here for this meet for this uh, interview yeah I think <clears throat> I think you all know that uh, we we make uh, an impression during the first minute of our meeting somebody uh, another person and that's very important that you know uh, we especially in the uh, financial services industry I think what we are looking for is we want to ask ourselves can I trust this person? Because that's what, um, that's what you're going to be doing. You should be trusted during the first few interactions. And, and that's, my, you know, that's my, my tip to you. Dress well, be friendly, and all the other tips that uh, has been given so far. In terms of our hiring process and what that looks like, we do have quite a rigorous hiring process. can take up to anywhere between four to six weeks. So I'll just explain what that process looks like. Initially, when you go online, you'd be able to submit your resume, apply to positions. Depending on the position you're applying to, there will be pre-screening questions there. If selected, um, we would contact you for a 30-minute telephone pre-screening, which is basically just designed to help gather more information on your background, your experience, your qualifications. Um, from there, we might send you an online self-assessment profile, ask for copies of the Ithaca or CSU we have them, and maybe even copies of annual performance appraisals if you have them. Um, from there, we would conduct a one-hour behavioral description interview, which if you're not familiar with it, I would highly recommend that you visit the Career Center and find out more about that, because today that's the kind of interviewing um, that companies are doing to look at what your past performance is, which is a future predictor, future behavior. From there, if you're selected, we would then have you go out at the branch level to meet with two branch managers. We have um, hiring panels that recruit for all of the positions within a particular district, and they're making final hiring decisions for all of the retail branch positions. So that you would meet with that panel. Again, it could be a behavioral interview. They might ask you some structured questions or even hypothetical questions. So um, again, it's being prepared in the interview, talking about yourself, knowing your experiences, um, and, and writing those kind of examples down before you actually go into the interview and even practicing in front of a family member or friend and, and getting some, bouncing off some ideas from them as to how you're responding to those questions and what else you can do to also flesh out and answer the, what you did and what your role was in that situation because that's really what we're looking for is you to describe situations that have happened in the past, how did you handle and deal with them, and then what was the end result, what happened. From there, if you're selected, um, we would then uh, extend the offer and usually we bring people on board within two weeks. Uh, references are completed by a third company uh, called Backcheck and we would require you to provide three managers as references. If you don't have that, we will accept one professor teacher or one volunteer reference. I just wanted to mention one thing that we forgot about, was about resumes. Don't put references available upon request. Like that's making like the person reading it do extra work. Just give them a re the, the references right up front. I think it's better. I just want to add one other thing. Uh, you know, a lot of firms now do do testing on you from a personality perspective and character perspective, so you need to be prepared for that. 
and the background checks tend to be much more rigorous than they used to be. So between police checks, between uh, reference checks, uh, are confirmed and reconfirmed again. So it's a very important part of the process. Thank you very much. Um, and and just thank you for that plug about um, the rigorous energy. Um, we do, in fact, do provide interview um, Okay, CBV is a char what's called the Chartered Business Evaluator. It's a designation that's given by the Canadian Institute of Chartered Business Evaluators in conjunction with York. And uh, it's what's involved is there's um, there's about six courses that you have to take, and then there's one and there's an exam for each course, and there's different assignments in the course of doing the course. Um, and then there's like a comprehensive final exam, which is very similar to the uh, Chartered Accountancy uh, Uniform Final Exam. It's very similar in terms of difficulty and pass rate. It's got about a 50, 60% pass rate usually for that exam. Most people do their CA first. I personally didn't. I had a completely different career path, which we can get into later if we have time. Uh, most people do. I would recommend it. Most people who are CBVs are CAs first. I recommend getting your CA first, which you can do with Deloitte. They've got excellent training for CAs. And as far as the CBV goes, how we train you is you work in our department and you work on actual assignments that you would do as a CBV. So you do business valuations, you do litigation support, and we've got you know very good assignments that we get and that we staff you on, and you work with other CBVs and they train you, and you learn by doing, and which makes it a lot easier, because if you get to that CBV exam and you've never really um, you know, had much practical experience, it will make it a lot more difficult than somebody who has had a lot of practical experience and who has done valuations. I mean, there still is the exam writing techniques part and the nerve, you know, <coughs> but if you've had the experience, it'll make it a lot easier. And the woods got fantastic training. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Any questions? Question? This question is for Jane. I was wondering for retail brand positions, for example, the CSRs, the customer service representatives, what other skills would you need except for like a sales experience or um, would you need any qualifications other than that? Um, okay, so working as a customer representative, which is a teleposition, you don't necessarily have to have sales experience, but we, we would be looking for people who have worked with customers. So it could be in hospitality, working in restaurants or hotels, um, even working as a cashier in, in a retail store, handling cash. Um, we're looking for people who um, are very personal, warm, friendly, customer focused, um, and problem solvers, because people come into the branch uh, for all kinds of different reasons. So really, um, and generally wanting to help customers and provide excellent customer service. Just one more question. I was wondering, would you be able to tell us what a day would look like, for example, in the light of, well, during the work of a customer service representative, what exactly would be the kind of things that they would be doing? Well, opening, um, depending upon your level of experience, so obviously once you've been working in a branch, there's sort of a, a routine that would revolve in terms of there's opening procedures, which would have to do with the vault, the ABM machines, making sure that um, all of the tellers' cash or their registers are, are loaded with cash, counting the cash at the end of the day, that's another thing that you would be doing. Um, throughout the day, there, there are usually peak periods, so um, through, during that time frame, some branches have very high volume, some might not have, have a, a slower volume of customers coming in, so 
you know, being very proactive, smiling, servicing their needs, um, and helping them. Um, also, throughout the day, your cash would need to be taken back to the vault. Um, and then we have, at the end of the day, there's, there's balancing. We usually have a head teller, um, and they're, again, counting all the cash. Um, and then there's the closing procedures that go on throughout, um, throughout the end of the day, and then the bank is then locked and the security is turned on. Thank you. <coughs> and actually, if I could ask our other panelists to answer that question as well. So um, the students who are um, entering into your organization uh, as a, at an entry level, um, what would a typical day in the life uh, of that role be like? What can they expect? Um, Edward? Well, I'll describe the, a day for a uh, financial advisor. Um, they start off, uh, first of all, of course, to, uh, you know, to, to plan their day. Very important. And uh, secondly, they, uh, they learn, they study, okay, they, uh, for um, you know, more advanced cases, for, or, or even, you know, review their, their file and see what they can do to a, uh, for a client. And uh, of course, after that, they would, uh, they would be involved in, in training. They would be involved in um, uh, prospecting, prospecting, which is very important. Um, and all of these, of course, is being dictated by, the, by a marketing plan that they themselves make. Okay. And of course, these marketing plans are all discussed with the managers and uh, being implemented and, and monitored so that you know, we, they would come out a success in their career and not just you know, uh, f you know, being ordinary. So uh, you know, the position of, uh, that's uh, available f uh, as, uh, f uh, in our organization as a financial, financial advisor is more as well, I think I'd like to point out, is more in, is entrepreneurial as well. Okay, so you know, you if you have that entrepreneurial spirit, that would be a fit for you, and uh, your day will mostly be dictated by what you want to achieve for that day. Very similar on the sales side, as an agent, you'd be out there working with someone or teaming up with someone to do sales visits. And it's that real time, on time sort of learning experience that's really critical to being successful on the agent side. You'd also be taking your courses for IFIC or for CSC or your life courses at the same time. So you'll get your designation so that you can sell. So you've got two of these things happening at the same time. If you're looking more on the corporate or home office perspective, we, you know, obviously we talked about these multiple streams. We have finance, we have marketing, we've got compliance, and we've got a number of other roles. Uh, I'll give you an example on the registration side of our business where people want to get licensed. We would work with the regulators all across Canada and uh, get uh, do research and due diligence on those individuals to make sure they're the right fit for the organization and then grant them their licenses. On the compliance side, what we do is monitor trade activities of field people. So if people are selling funds like mutual funds or any type of other products, we monitor their activities to make sure that they're selling correctly. And if they're not, if there's any issue, then we meet with them and talk about it and make sure that they've uh, done the right thing. So there's always something going on. It's a very busy, dynamic business. Um, in ours, what we, we're always like doing a number of different assignments, like we may be valuing a company. Like for example, right now we've got, I've got on the go, we've got uh, a company that owns a, numerous car dealerships. And uh, one of their, couple of partners, one guy owns part of a couple of Honda dealers and the other guy owns part of another kind of dealer and they're switching it around for various reasons. So we're doing evaluation of these car dealers for the purposes of this corporate reorganization, that's one thing. I've got another one in the home healthcare space where it was owned by three people and one of them wants to get out so we have to value her shares so they can buy her shares so she can leave the business. Um, We've got, um, so we do a lot of stuff like that. So as like a, just a beginning person, you would start off like with the more or less, you know, like summarizing the financial statements, working with somebody who's more experienced, maybe doing some industry research on some of these industries to see what uh, some of the issues are. You might come to a meeting with somebody who's more senior to meeting the client 
just taking notes and listening and then you know once you get more experience you might start working and doing a whole valuation yourself there's also the um, litigation side of the business so for example we do stuff like say somebody's hurt in a car accident uh, we work for like both plaintiff uh, lawyers and defense lawyers so for a plaintiff lawyer we're trying to figure out how much can this person make now that they've been hurt maybe they can't work anymore maybe they can't work in the same capacity they can work only part-time so we figure out how much would they have made till they turn 65 let's say after, now that they've had the accident compared to what they would have earned prior to that we also do other things like we had a case recently um, in the aerospace industry where a company had a division every single person from the division left and went to work for their competitors so our client is suing this competitor and all these employees who left for like breach of contract and breach of trust and fiduciary duty. So we're trying to figure out what their losses are. So we're basically looking at what the company earned prior to this incident happening, compared to what they're making now, what customers did they lose, how much revenue would they have made from these customers. So it's very varied. We also do some, um, some stuff like forensic accounting stuff, like fraud investigations and that sort of thing. So you really learn, you start off doing some of the more simpler things. And that's something that I'm sure everybody here would agree. When you first start off, you might think, oh, what do I have to do? This sounds, this sounds boring. I shouldn't be doing stuff like this. That's, that kind of an attitude will kill you. Like what happens is when you first start, you're basically doing like the starting off stuff. Whatever they give you, just do it, do it well, do it happily, and then you'll get better stuff to do eventually after that. On, on the corporate side, on an entry level, we've got call center opportunities where you're working with our agents in the field and answering some of their questions that they have. Uh, we've got administration based on different departments that we have. So we have a lot of different administration jobs, either on the licensing side, compliance side, marketing side. And they'll, those sort of grow to other opportunities within those groups. Um, from an education perspective, um, you know, we look at all different backgrounds. You can, you know, it's always good to have a business background in the financial services <laughs> industry, but it's not the defining thing that we look for. Uh, we look for um, uh, desire to work, uh, commitment, and uh, professionalism. And, and if you put that all together with the ability to learn, which is really important, then we've got a good fit. Thank you. Okay. Yes, hello. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Jeffrey Bevins. I'm a fourth year political science major. Um, I was wondering uh, how best, uh, given that I'm from a non-business background, how best I would, uh, I would be, um, how best I ought to tailor resumes and cover letters so as to convey uh, my interest in business to uh, the prospective employer. Um, for a non-business student, That's correct. how can you compete with business students? Okay. I'll, I'll answer that. Sure. Um, I have seen, we, again, we're recruiting from a broad spectrum in the workplace, so um, it's not fixed in stone. Candidates don't necessarily only have to have a, a, a finance, business, accounting degree. We will, uh, I do look at candidates who have um, a general arts degree, and such as yours. So um, one um, recommendation I would have would be to take a look at a functional resume, um, and then look at your work experience, and then pick two or three categories and then the bullet point form under those, what experiences you've had in your different types of jobs doing that. Um, I think you, you, you have transferable skill sets, so you need to look at what experiences you have had and how can they transition or transit over into other types of positions. Mm -hmm. If you've done volunteer experience, if you've um, worked um, with your alumni, um, if you've taken on any kind of leadership um, positions, working with different clubs or organizations, um, or associations within the university, demonstrate those qualities and mention them on your resume. Um, I think volunteerism speaks a lot to that, so you know, I wouldn't shy away from not putting volunteer work on your resume. I'd highly recommend that you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think like in the basically in the basic accounting auditing scheme, if you're interested in that, you'll have to have those accounting type courses for sure. But there may be other areas that Deloitte has where you wouldn't need that, like maybe in consulting. It's always good to have a university degree no matter what you do with it. Mm. So, I mean, you can always go to law school. That's what my brother did. He's got political science. 
and he went to law school and he's doing very, very well. My, you know, I told you my undergrad's in psychology, which is uh, obviously a, a general degree. Uh, what, what I did was I took economics courses to balance off my psychology degree with that. And, and that gave me sort of a, an understanding of what I would be getting into in the financial services industry. Um, when I graduated, though, I went into the banking side. And uh, I have to commit, I have to say that Scotiabank's got best, one of the best training around. So, uh, you know, if you want to learn, it's a great place to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, another thing, and, and this is uh, particularly for uh, Ms. Atkinson, is um, I understand you have it for retail. Um, what opportunities are there within Social Bank, which is a very good thing, are there to move around, say, perhaps from retail to uh, commercial banking? Or Absolutely. I have, like that? Yeah, I have seen that happen. I've been, I worked downtown in, um, on Bay Street, the head office, and I've, um, it's not uncommon for people to work at Scotiabank Bank for 10, 20, 30, or even 40 years. So they might have started working out as a teller, and today they're a manager of customer service, they're a branch manager. So they might have started out working in the branch, but then they could also move into the head office. They can start working in recruiting. They might want to work um, in, in HR and total rewards. They might want to work in, in commercial. So I have seen a lot of people move around within the bank and working, they could start off in the retail side, move to head office and then go back out to retail or from the head office they did then decide they want to move into a different area. So they start taking courses, could be a say for example project management and, um, and then from there they could move into a totally different career. Just one more. Okay. The last thing is, it seems as if um, nowadays um, the uh, application process is quite rigorous, and then it's quite um, sort of orderly. Um, what opportunities are there to um, like network so as to uh, sort of help your case? Like I, uh, I believe I heard Mr. Paulus have mentioned, you guys do um, charity events. Would it be sensible to just show up and be like, hey, I'm me, uh, trying to meet people and. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever tried it, but uh, <laughs> what, what I was talking about is our impact day where we go out into the community and organize things like maybe go to, like I've been the last couple of years, I ran like a barbecue at a home for adults with mental and physical disabilities and we went and have a barbecue for the residents and play games with them and, you know, and they enjoy it, they like to see people and what have you. So, I mean, you could phone the Lloyd Head office and say you understand they have an impact day and you'd like to volunteer. I'm sure they'd be, say, great, sure, we'll put you on something for sure. So, there is, you know, I'm sure there's opportunities like that. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Did anyone else on the panel want to talk about the um, role that perhaps networking has in helping candidates to yeah. land a job mm -hmm. or? Get more information that might help you get a job? Yeah, 30%. Well, I'd say in terms of hires, I've been told numbers 70% of the people we hire are through a website, 30% are through referrals. Um, and so referrals means any people could walk into a branch, speak to someone, and they're referring the resume out to us. Or talking to friends or family who work at the company you're interested in, or who may know someone who worked. In that, in that company. So I do think networking is important. Um, using LinkedIn, using you know, these kind of social websites where you can connect with people who can connect you on to the next person. And, um, and I have heard it's usually, um, usually it's six points of interaction that you need to, to network with to finally get to meet the person, um, your, next, your next manager that you could be working for. So I, I do highly recommend networking. Um, I think it's a, it's a great thing to do. Um, and I also wanted to mention that the branches recruit independently for the customer representative roles. So we would encourage you to visit your local Scotiabank branches, bring in your resume, ask to speak to the manager of customer service, and they can tell you if they currently have any vacancies available. If they don't, they might refer you onto our corporate website to apply online. But again, you've gone into the branch, you've met someone, and you've made a contact. And we would highly recommend that you market yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just say there, you know, there's always cooperative opportunities. Uh, all firms are always looking for individuals like yourself to come in and, and be part of the organization for a short period of time. That's a great way to network and meet different people. 
The other aspect is uh, making appointments with the various firms' HR departments and sitting down and asking questions and saying what opportunities are there available, both paid and unpaid. And uh, sometimes you have to take some of those unpaid opportunities and work with them in the short term because it's a bit of an opportunity for us to, to evaluate, evaluate yourself at the same time. So you need to really be open-minded about opportunities, being those paid or unpaid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think adding, adding to that is um, recruiters always look for, well, they view favorably people who are referred by the existing workforce in the company. So, you know, networking is a great way, great way to have your foot on the door. Okay, oh, basically we're looking for people who have that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, candidates who are highly motivated, who can, uh, can self-motivate, okay? Um, we are also looking for people who have passion, who can tell us why they want to be in that career, and not only to be in that career, but why they want to succeed in that career. So that's what we're looking for, basically. Uh, are exams important for actual science students trying to find jobs in an insurance company? Uh, uh, can you repeat again? Yes. Uh, are actual science exams important for students trying to find jobs in an insurance company? Are actuarial. actuarial. Okay, um, now actuarial, there, there is a, well, that's, that belongs again to the, um, you know, back office of, a, of, a, of an insurance company. Uh, if that is where your training is, uh, you, can, you can apply for an actuarial job, okay? Um, you know, it, it all depends on the fit. Even if you're an actuarial and you want to be in uh, field sales, no problem, as long as you fit in the, in the, um, in the uh, ideal profile of that uh, position. If you're, if you're more interested in the actuary, you're probably better at like yeah. Aon or something like that. Actuaries do very, very well. It's a very rigorous program, very hard to get that designation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The pay is great. I know some guys who are actuaries. The pay is very, very good. You can get some very good positions with a company like Richards, like Aon, on the corporate side or a company manual life or somewhere like that, rather than like a sales position. Like you mm -hmm. wouldn't go through all that typical mathematical training to become an actuary to go into sales necessarily. You may as well use your skills as an actuary. Yeah, you know, um, uh, actuaries are great, but they're not always the best salespeople. And mm -hmm. uh, so from, a, from a, a life insurance perspective, marks are very important. Mm -hmm. But what's really happening out in the actuarial side is the ability for you to move from one country to another. And having uh, multiple languages are very important because the products are really converging into the same, being the same. And risk is the same everywhere now. It can be in North America, it can be in Europe, or it can be in South America. So they want people that have a very broad background and can be shipped from one country to another to learn that, uh, to manage risk and bring it back to product design. Yeah, and I they should have should mention also that with Deloitte, there's very lots of opportunities to go to another country for like a year or so. Yeah. They're always talking about it. Like we have like an internal intranet or whatever where they always talking about like this one went to Australia or that one went to the UK. One of our partners in uh, who's like very experienced in anti money laundering just moved to Australia and took over the Australian. He's like lead partner of the Australian anti-money laundering division, or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So there's a lot of opportunities if you love traveling to go to very, and they love when people do that. One of the people that used to work with me went to move to Hong Kong. I, I think that's a really important point that's really changed in the job market out there is 
a lot of firms are really looking for people that can move and go to other places. Um, it's just not Canada anymore. It's Canada, United States, Europe, Asia, Latin America, because global firms are thinking globally. And so they want their employees to start thinking that way and contribute to the company in a global fashion. Thank you so much. Your question about actuarial exams is the designation, right? So I, I'm just wondering, so for anyone who's interested in becoming an actuary, um, do they need to have, uh, you know, finish their exams and all yeah. that mm -hmm. You can You can be a, a co-op student at, at a life insurance company while you're getting your, re your designation, your actuarial designation, but ultimately once you get your designation, you need to have good marks, and, mm -hmm. and it's good to have some cooperative background as well. corporate HR. We also have what are called manager staffing and planning and they will look at compensation within uh, particular districts and regions and they're managing that. So your math aptitude or ability I think would definitely lend itself well in, in that kind of capacity. Obviously if you're working um, in sales you're constantly doing math calculations, looking at interest rates um, and doing these kinds of calculations regularly before customers in front of you, you know, to calculate their mortgages, their loans, um, their investments, mutual funds, JSEs, RSPs, your math aptitude would be there. Also, if you want to become a financial planner, then again, you're doing um, financial planning holistically. Math would be involved in that as well. Uh, well, I, I think it's a good, you know, if you get your, what is it, like a Bachelor of Commerce in math, or is it a Bachelor of Science in math, whatever it is. I think it's a good, it's a good designation, then you can go on from there to get something some other designation. I don't know what you can do with just the math one itself, but it, it's a good skill. You need math, and what we do, we we do need math. I mean, accounting's not all numbers, but it's still, you have to know it, and that shows uh, intelligence. It's a good designation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I have one more question about just what's the Well, on the actuarial side, in the insurance industry, it's a pretty important cornerstone of what, what we do. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the, the president of Transamerica Life Canada is an actuarial individual. So it, it does lead to broader understanding of running an organization. But, um, uh, you know, again, from a life insurance perspective, actuarials are sort of put into a certain role in terms of managing risk for our organization and and they grow from there yeah and uh, like I was said before if you want to become a CA you have to have the accounting courses um, and if you
you want to go, like in some of the other areas, you need like go out and get your MBA or your CFA or what, but there's a lot of math involved in that. There's statistics and so if you're good in math, that would probably help you in your CFA course for sure. Mm -hmm. So you can consider doing that maybe. Yeah. Cool. department obviously we would have junior or entry level accounting positions you know anything accounts receivable accounts payable um, when you go onto our website you can actually do keyword searches so you can pull up the accounting department you can um, search by title or you can just type in like accounts receivable accounts payable anything in the job description or that you're looking for if any of those postings have those words in it it will be pulled up for you and you can apply directly to those postings Yeah, we, we would have the same sort of similar roles. Uh, we're, what I'm responsible for, our finance people do the same thing, accounts receivable, accounts payable. They do some payroll. Uh, they do some um, commissions, things like that. But very, it's a generalist position. And I'm not sure as far as the way goes, what if there is any difference if you're doing your CMA versus doing your CA. I'm sure there are people there that have their CMAs. Uh, but you can certainly check on our website and find out for sure. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is CY. Uh, I'm a third year accounting major student at York. Uh, I have a question regarding forensic accounting, which uh, Stephen spoke about. I would like to know what are the criteria or requirements to get into forensic accounting. Uh, what is the scope of forensic accounting? And uh, which institution provides certification for forensic accounting? Well, there's a lot. It's a very big area, and there's a lot of things you can do. There's the IFA designation. That's a uh, good one. I still would recommend getting your CA first and then maybe getting your IFA after, which is an investigative forensic accountant. A lot of guys are like CA-IFA. Uh, so you can do stuff like anti-money laundering. Analytics is a very big area now. Downtown at Deloitte, in our office at 33 Young Street, we've got a big forensic lab where they do a lot of analytic work. They do work for very big companies like, um, like the Ontario uh, Lottery Corporation. And we just did, we've done work for all kinds of big companies on fraud investigations. And some of the stuff that they do is through analytics. There's anti-money laundering. I, myself, am a certified fraud examiner. And that's given through the, um, through the Certified <coughs> Fraud Examiner Association out of the United States. It's the ACFI, ACFP. I think that's it. Association of Certified Fraud Examiners out of the States, out of uh, uh, Texas. So, but I, I still would get like an accounting designation maybe first rather than just going for that, it's more, it's probably better. Most people who are in that have that designation first. Although some people don't, we've got some people in our, on the analytics side downtown who are like, uh, got their, P we've got one girl, woman who's got her PhD in analytics who works in the lab. So, you know, the math is very good for that also. Our friend, I don't know if she's still here, who was studying math, that might be a good area because there's a lot of, uh, the analytics side is very, very big now. The only way to become a forensic accounting is to achieve, to get your certification as a CA first? I'm not sure if it is. I think you can get your CFE, definitely you can get your certified fraud examiner. Just go to their website, ACFE. Just look up ACFE I don't, and you'll find out what, what, what you have to have to get that designation. And I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about the investigative and forensic accountant. If you can do that without having your, an accounting designation, you probably can. They'll probably just make you take a lot more courses, that's all. But given that you have an accounting background, so you got your BCom? Uh, yes, accounting. Okay, so you may get some exemptions. You should just contact them and see. I think maybe, wasn't that through York? I thought York had that. that uh, 
You should check. It's the I. Um, the what did I say? ACFE. Yeah. No, ACFE is the is for to become a certified fraud examiner, but the uh, the investigative and forensic accounting designation that's a good designation, which is a lot more in depth than getting your CFE. So just look, call them, and go on their website and find out. You don't have to have. I'm just recommending because I think it's better <coughs> to get your CA first and then do that in case you want to do other things also. So basically, do your research. Yeah, do your I research. I mean, you're interested in something, do as much some research. of the guys that are uh, work with us in the lab are ex police officers. Like one of the guys who's one of the biggest partners in Deloitte in financial advisory is this gentleman named Peter Dent. You can Google him. Why don't you Google him? You'll see what his background is. Peter Dent. He was with the Ontario Provincial Police for about 10 years, I believe. He worked at the World Bank, and I think he got all his designations after he was with the police, I'm not sure. Just Google and you'll find out. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have time for one more question, and we've got one more question. Okay. Um, what is the best way to understand accounting? Uh, I want to know the cultural fit. Now there is a company industry investment organization and bank. And we have to know our actually we are feeding actually each company. So I think uh, as a senior members in the actually all financial sector, I think you know which culture is distinct actually distinctly describe accounting company or industry, insurance company and bank. So you want to know more about the co corporate culture of each of these firms? Yeah. Um, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, we are a very large international bank. We're very diverse, so um, certain positions will require people to speak certain languages. Um, but I think when, some of the main things that we look for, I think, um, in any position are people who are customer focused, um, who are results focused, who, um, who are really a team focused person, so they know how to work well with other people, their peers and management. Um, who are flexible and um, you know even having good people skills being being strong in, in relationship building because you know your customer if you're working internally in an accounting department your customer could be another department you could be supporting a certain business line so I think having those kind of good customer service skills is also really important mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes uh, speaking of um, company culture um, Faith Life, uh, our organization is um, is a it's a faith-based organization. So, uh, company culture is m more of uh, member services, um, looking for the um, looking out for others, and uh, that's very prevalent in our organization, um, and that that pervades the working environment within our organization at Faith Life. Very, very similar to, to Scotiabank, we're a very diverse company. We have operations all over the world. So, in you know, in in an accounting role, you you, you need to have a diverse background, and you need to uh, obviously be a people person, because you're going to be dealing with different internal customers, and uh, their needs are different, and that's uh, that's really important in our corporate culture is the ability to be a problem solver, but also be a, a good coworker to to move the company forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very similar with Deloitte also. It is also a very big company. It's very employee-focused, like they try and, you know, it would be nice to the employees, I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but, you know, like we've got different programs for employees. We've got, uh, they give you personal days, there's vacation days. Um, they give you good, very good training. That's one thing, it's a very good place to learn. Like a lot, if you look at some of the partners at other, accounting firms, like you go look at Meyer Morris Penny, all their people are the board, pretty much. You know, like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a very people focused, it's a very diversity focused, it's very, uh, we sponsor, for example, we sponsor the Women of Influence Luncheon. There's programs for women to get ahead so they can progress in the firm, it's very mentor oriented, so when you join you're given a coach who helps you sort of navigate through the firm. They're very big on diversity. So that's that's an important issue in the firm. So it, it's, it's a very good place to work and learn, and especially when you're first starting out. 
because they train you very well. So even if you don't stay with the firm, you'll just get the very good training to begin with. Um, so this brings us to the end of our formal Q&A session. Um, our intention for the, uh, this afternoon session was really to provide you with um, an opportunity to learn about um, opportunities within um, the financial services sector, particularly within these firms, um, these organizations, and some, uh, give you some strategies and tips for um, securing uh, and learning about these opportunities. So um, we trust you found the information and insights